Um, my name is Martin Woolacott. I was the foreign affairs columnist of The Guardian for some 10 years, and before that, uh, a foreign editor and a foreign correspondent, uh, including a stint in the Middle East in the mid-70s, when I visited Israel quite uh, frequently. And since then, I've been back to Israel on a number of occasions, and I've written more than my fair share of opinion pieces about what Israel should and shouldn't do. Um, Welcome to one of the Frontline Club's discussions with distinguished visiting foreign journalists. He is David Horowitz, the editor of the Jerusalem Post. And we're here to hear what he has to say about his job, about uh, Israeli journalism, about the relationship between the Israelis and Palestinians, the prospects, if any, uh, for a settlement, um, about the broader problems of the region and about the antagonism between Iran and Israel, which now seems to be becoming a defining feature of the geopolitical landscape in that part of the world. David's British-born, went to Israel as a young man. He's been a journalist there for 25 years. He worked for the Jerusalem Post. Initially uh, moved on to the Jerusalem Report he was a stringer for major British papers, including especially the Independent and also the Financial Times. <coughs> he became the editor of the Jerusalem Post in 2004. Um, and uh, uh, he's had two editorships then, the report and now this. Um, he is very much a writing and traveling editor. He does a column once a week. and opinion pieces on top of that occasionally. He does online discussions and he, he reports too. He was at Annapolis, for instance. So he's not a backroom boy as an editor. He's very much to the fore. Now the way I want to organize, <coughs> organize this uh, discussion is to begin by asking David a few questions about uh, his position, or rather the position of the Jerusalem Post in Israeli journalism and in the journalism that serves the, the diaspora, uh, readers outside of Israel. Um, and then to move on to discuss the key issues that face Israel and other Middle Eastern countries um, in four main groups, bundles of questions. First of all, obviously, the Israeli-Palestinian situation, or whatever you want to call it, beginning there with the state of play in Gaza, state of play with Hamas, then on to what I see as the gridlock problem of Israeli politics, why decisions are so hard to reach, why solutions seem to slip out of the grasp of that political system and whether that can change. Thirdly, the problems of Israeli society, about which David himself has written very interesting and even quite moving pieces. And fourthly, the regional question I touched on earlier and in particular the relationship with Iran. By recalling my own first trip to <coughs> Israel in the mid-70s, I followed a tried and true routine as recommended by old hands. I took a taxi bus to Jerusalem from the airport, went at once to the American colony, uh, secured an old room, because to get a new room at the colony was absolutely naff, got in the cab, went down to the government press office, registered for a press card, came back to the colony, had a coffee and a slice of the American colony's chocolate cake, which in those days was one of the few culinary triumphs in a rather bleak <laughs> Jerusalem landscape in terms of food, um, and then walked across to the little bookshop, which in those days was opposite the entrance to the colony, and ordered the Jerusalem Post for the duration of my stay, and also the little English language Palestinian bulletins which were available. I think one was a shortened English version of Al-Quds. And in that was an uh, indication of the, of the continued disparity between uh, journal uh, journalistic resources and journalistic performance between Israelis and Palestinians. But it was quite a good guide uh, to a reporter arriving in Israel without either Arabic or Hebrew. The Jerusalem Post in those days was known as the Liberal Paper, supporter of the Labour Party. It seemed uh, 
liberal in retrospect uh, uh, after Conrad Black took over the paper. Um, and under his proprietorship, it was regarded as very right-wing indeed. Um, since then, there are new proprietors. And David, as the new editor, is seen as having moved the paper a little bit uh, towards the center. Some might say more than a little bit. Some might say less than a little bit. Opinions amongst Israelis seem to differ. David himself is on record as saying, I think, that left-right is not a useful way of looking at Israeli journalism. But I have to begin by saying, asking him, particularly with the Conrad Black chapter uh, there in the past, um, is the Jerusalem Post a right-wing paper? And if that's not the right way to look at uh, uh, Israeli media, what is the right way? And what has he tried to do with the paper since he took it over? Long introduction. You okay. can speak so, nowadays. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for, for coming. And I, I appreciate um, the opportunity to, to have the conversation. Uh, I don't know where it's going to go in the course of the evening, but I, I feel very strongly that the more uh, information people have uh, from the widest uh, array of sources, the better judgments and assessments people can make. Um, and therefore, the, you know, an opportunity, it's not firsthand, because I've come from there to here, but um, so slightly indirect. Uh, nonetheless, I'm, I'm pleased to have the opportunity. Uh, if you went to the American Colony today, you find Tony Blair there, by the way. I understand. In one of the old rooms. In, uh, I think he's got, he's got the rooftop uh, he's terrace. Got the he's got the passion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, if, you, you know, if, you, if you don't mind me digressing every now and again, uh, extraordinary for, for uh, um, when I read the, I think it's the, um, the Piers Morgan book on, uh, on his uh, editorship in, in the Blair uh, uh, era. And every other page, it seems, the Prime Minister's calling them in. And you think, that can't be true. And you know, newspaper editors can't really be given that much access by uh, the British Prime Minister. I'm not being called in every other day by Tony Blair, but I, I see that that is uh, a, a way that he works. And when I, when I first went to see him uh, on the roof terrace of the American colony, uh, he was seated as you were, and I came out of the door. And he, he bounded, our photographer was there, he bounded across the terrace to meet me as though his whole life until that point had just been <laughs> the lead up to that opportunity to meet with me. And that's, you know, after I'd you know, calm myself and realized that probably wasn't the case, nevertheless, very, uh, very effective. Um, so so your, your, um, your sketch of the post history was, um, was, was pretty uh, close to my understanding. Obviously, I haven't been there the, the whole time. It's 75 years old. Uh, it used to be called the Palestine Post. The company name is still called the Palestine Post. Uh, it changed its name uh, soon after the establishment of the State of Israel. It was um, very close to the Labour Party. I think it's uh, probably apocryphal uh, that uh, they would read the editorials to the Prime Minister's office to make sure that uh, 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 the Prime Minister approved of them. But it was certainly a Labour Party newspaper. It was sold by um, the owners who were Labour Party linked at the end of the 80s. Um, Many journalists, uh, myself among them, uh, resigned from the paper at that time. Uh, to my immense good fortune, a, a new publication called The Jew Report was being set up at around that time, and I worked from 1990 until 2004 for The Jerusalem Report, yeah. which ironically in about 1998 got bought by uh, uh, Hollinger, Conrad Black, and became part of the, uh, uh, the wider group. Um, just to fill you in a little bit on that, because it was interesting, because The Jerusalem Report um, using these definitions that are uh, problematic was certainly perceived to be a liberal publication in the, uh, counterintuitively, in the Hollinger stable. Uh, I didn't work with Black at all at any point. I've never met Conrad Black. I um, was reporting to his partner, David Radler. Mm. Uh, and I think they, I can only assume they relished the, the notion that they were owning a title that was a little bit unexpected for them. And they didn't intervene in, uh, in editorial there. Uh, it was uh, as Hollinger was collapsing in 2004, the paper was put up for sale. Uh, I was appointed editor actually before it was sold. It was then taken over by an Israeli uh, former sports reporter who went onto the business side, um, and that was a little more than three years ago. Um, the, the, the term that I use, and I, I can see you've, you've been right there, I've tried to make it inclusive, it's non-partisan. In other words, uh, the Jerusalem Post in the past, for example, I think in an election, maybe two or three elections ago, uh, endorsed Nathan Sharansky's political party uh, and took other positions that were very uh, um, clearly partisan. Uh, in the last elections, we didn't endorse a, a particular party. Um, we, uh, uh, we are certainly dedicated to taking editorial positions that we think 
uh, serve the well-being of Israel, the Jewish nation. Uh, we are not in any party's uh, pocket by any means. Um, just to give you a sense of, of a line I took on one of the, the key uh, um, internal, but also rele relevant to the region issues that is about to flare up again, uh, when the interim report of what is called the Winograd Committee, which was uh, investigating the, the second Lebanon war, the war with Hezbollah a year and a half ago, when its interim report came out, uh, our editorial line was that it was so damning in terms of uh, the uh, incompetence, apparent incompetence at uh, um, prime ministerial level, um, that we, you know, we took the line that the prime minister should resign. Um, could, I, could I ask you then, will you take that line again when the... the, I, the, the, the if the, the, the more final report um, uh, confirms the conclusions of the interim report. Okay, I'm, I'm, I, I, um, I don't want to echo the uh, remarks of the Labour Party leader, Mr. Barak, uh, uh, too closely, but you have to, we have to wait to see the, uh, the final report. But uh, it's hard to imagine that the final report would be less devastating. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in particular, because the interim report did not deal with the final stages of that war, uh, on the last couple of days, when a ceasefire resolution was apparently imminent, um, 33 or so Israeli soldiers were killed. Uh, and that was not covered in the interim report. Um, and therefore, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't want to commit myself to a position that would be foolish before I've read the report. Yeah. But we yeah. took a very, very firm position on a report which I think is going to be uh, um, overtaken by something uh, uh, no less harsh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> as a result of that uh, extra three days that were added on, uh, David Grossman's uh, son was killed. That was uh, so something that was widely reported throughout the world because, of his, uh, because he's a well-known writer and a person of importance in, in Israel and, and a person that many people read with great pleasure and find very enlightening. He, he concluded, uh, he, he wrote after the death of his son that uh, what Lebanon had proved, the Second Lebanon War had proved, was that um, military strength alone could not ultimately guarantee Israel's existence. Uh, I, we're, we're drifting ahead here, but let's go there because uh, you, you brought up that, uh, that very um, bad patch, um, bad for Israel, uh, bad for the region. Um, you seem to see it as a question of incompetence um, in the execution of the war. Uh, others take a more fundamental view and see the whole war as a mistake. I, I would take that to be David Grossman's view, possibly wrongly, but um, what do you say to that? There is an instrumental criticism and there is a more fundamental yeah. criticism. Um, just let's uh, um, remember how we got into that situation a year and a half ago. Um, Israel had been maintaining a buffer zone in southern Lebanon um, for much of a generation, um, which was serving as a uh, means f of protecting northern Israel from yeah. attack. Um, it was coming under tremendous international criticism for maintaining that zone, and it was losing about two, two dozen soldiers every year in that zone. And one of the key um, policy uh, pledges that helped Ehud Barak win the elections of, I think, 1999 uh, was the pledge to bring Israel to Lebanon. Israel came back uh, mm -hmm. to the international border in May 2000 to a UN demarcated international border um, with um, the uh, understanding that the international community would ensure um, a robust peacekeeping force uh, and ultimately uh, a robust assertion of Lebanese sovereignty rather than uh, hostile um, groups filling the vacuum which did not occur, of course. What happened was that Hezbollah took over southern Lebanon. Now, the... the um they did, but they didn't actually attack Israel systematically. There was a kind of de facto standoff so well, the, the uh, Let me give you a, a sense of... of uh, which I'll do often. Perhaps we I, shouldn't I get too far into No, that's okay. I, I, look, I don't mind. Yeah. Uh, um, the consensual Israeli sense, which is, I think, useful to try and convey here, uh, is that uh, Hezbollah was basically serving as, as the front line of the Iranian army, yeah. and that Israel uh, was desperate to have its, lab, its unilateral withdrawal from Lebanon work out. It did not want, it had, had a, a, a traumatized historical fear of getting dragged back into Lebanon. And therefore, it essentially did not uh, act as Hezbollah 
established a degree of, uh, of something akin to sovereignty in southern Lebanon. In fact, you had a, a reality where Israel, I think it can be argued, conceded sovereignty at the border. The, the incident in which uh, uh, the two soldiers were kidnapped and others killed uh, that uh, um, prompted uh, the war um, took place beneath an observation uh, post inside Israel that the Israeli army had abandoned. Uh, Sharon's position was over and again, uh, he was told by commanders up north, Hezbollah is doing this, they're, they're building that, stay out of it. Maybe Lebanon is moving towards a democratic process. I can see you want to get on, but let me, yeah. uh, let me try and uh, uh, um, uh, answer the, 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 the root of your question. Um, and, and the sense in Israel was that Hezbollah had built up this strategic missile capability, and not that it was uh, any kind of uh, benign status quo, but that it was a, 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 a worsening situation. And therefore, the, the sense in Israel and the uh, overwhelming thrust of this Winograd uh, initial report was less uh, a, a critique of the war, which uh, um, I, I don't want to say whether you got Grossman right or wrong. Yeah. Uh, there, there was certainly plenty of criticism within Israel of the war per se, but the mainstream sensibility and certainly the thrust of this report was not that Israel should not have tried to uh, um, remove the threat, pose, the strategic threat posed by Hezbollah, but that uh, the campaign had not been thought through properly. That yeah. if Sharon or Rabin or others had yeah. been prime minister, maybe they would have waited a little longer. Yeah. Somebody said to me, you know, the, the, the previous uh, Lebanese war, they spent a year and a half uh, preparing for it. This one was decided in a matter of, of hours and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, um, we perhaps better draw a, a bit of a line under that for the time being. Um, my only final question would be, uh, what I was really seeking for was your own view, in retrospect, of whether the Lebanon war was uh, basically uh, uh, for you as a journalist and an Israeli um, something you had you thought about in terms of we have to have more competent more uh, far-sighted military and uh, political leaders who think things through more carefully have better wars as it were or whether your conclusion was military force is not a solution to these kinds of situations um, I, look I don't want Israel to have to live for the future by the sword uh, I, I have three kids, um, I have two boys, my eldest are boys, they'll be going into the army. Um, I would love Israel to be able to achieve normalized relations on all of its borders. I think it's naive uh, to believe that there is no military aspect to that, and, and then we're into you know, lots of, of, of nuances and so on. Well, but we're, we're drifting away. I, I, think, I also think it's naive, naive to think there's no military aspect to that, but uh, you perhaps have to turn the question over and say, what is the military aspect? to it that we're really talking about. Are we talking about um, the problem of preserving an Israeli military uh, capacity which far outweighs that of anybody, any other actor in the region? Uh, or are we talking about defensive <coughs> arrangements which would be understandable in any state? Well, you know, we're, we're in a conversation where you've got a lot of ground to cover, but yeah. here we are right into the essential yeah. issues. Yeah. So let's take a second here and, and uh, um, give, uh, give ourselves a, a reminder that we're talking about uh, a country that is nine miles wide at its narrowest point, uh, mm -hmm. that is uh, uh, six to seven hours top to bottom, seven to eight hours if you drive more like a Brit than an Israeli. It's a, it's a, the, the size issue and the uh, um, number of people living in Israel as opposed to the people in a either hostile or potentially hostile or previously hostile region uh, give Israel, uh, I, I think first of all those two factors are central to understanding anything about Israel. Tiny country, massively outweighed in terms of, of population as well as territory. Uh, is, Israelis as a consensual position do not look to the future and say well of course everything's going to be fine here, everything is assured here, quite the reverse. There's a sense in Israel sort of clinging on. Now, now yes Israel has tremendous military, decisive military might and however um, incompatible this may be with the sense uh, of Israel that is sometimes conveyed abroad. Uh, Israel feels very strongly that it uh, seeks to avoid it using uh, um, much of its force. That of course it could remake the Middle East mil militarily uh, given the decisive military advantage that it has, that it tries not to do that, that it's being forced to fight these sort of, I'm sure we'll talk about this some more anyway, so don't worry. Uh, well, it's being forced to fight, I, I fight these kind Mr. of... Mr. Sharon did try to do that. It didn't work. <laughs> that it's being forced now to fight these kind of asymmetrical wars and so on. Again, I, I see that you want to, uh, to, to, to move on, so I'll defer to that. But yeah. the, the point that I'm trying to make in answer to your question is, I think uh, the consensual Israeli position, and one that I share, is that it would need to be a, a combination of um, 
a, a, a knowledge part and awareness in the region that Israel could not be destroyed. And, and the aspects of that have changed a great deal lately, which we, I think we're going to talk about when we talk about Iran, yeah. right? Uh, it combined with an effort through diplomatic efforts. So in other words, that you have to have that military capability to give the diplomatic process any kind of realistic chance of success. Okay, well, we diverged there, but quite fruitfully, I think. Um, I can't let the journalistic bit of this go by without raising the question of the Christian um, edition of the Jerusalem Post. Uh, I, I take this, I have uh, not been able to see a copy, but uh, I take the Christian edition of the Post <coughs> to be not aimed at Anglican vicars in the Cotswolds. Um, but rather at the American evangelical community. Um, and I wonder about that for, for obvious reasons. You, you've had to bat this criticism off many times, I'm sure. But it does seem to me uh, open to the question of whether you're going too far uh, to find extra readers and extra revenue when you um, up, reach out to an audience which takes an extremely instrumental view, to put it at its most neutral, of Israel and of Judaism. Um, and this is, a, this is the journalistic end of a much broader argument about the relationship between Israel and certain parts of the Christian community, particularly in the United States. So I... Look, I think there's uh, a couple of points. Um, first of all, in, in recent years, and notably during the Second Intifada, when Israel was under terrorist onslaught, um, the, there were very few um, people who were expressing any kind of support for Israel. Gave Israel the conundrum of how to deal with uh, overwhelming support, some of it from a Christian community that was genuinely uh, supportive of Israel without preconditions, and some of it that had some kind of apocalyptic agenda. Yeah. Uh, um, and, it's, uh, and these are subtle nuances. Uh, and they've uh, exercised Israel. Our Christian edition, it's the Christian edition. That means it has focus on archaeological issues. It has focus on uh, um, uh, aspects of Israel that would not be uh, particularly prominent in the, in the normal daily coverage, yeah. as well as uh, op-eds from across the spectrum and so on. I'm, I'm sure that you're right that the readership is largely, first of all, it's not a particularly large readership, but that, that re such readership as it is, is drawn from the people who are most passionately caring about Israel. Uh, but we, you know, in the same way, uh, put it this way, I, I, th there can be nothing in there um, uh, uh, to the best of my abilities that would be um, uh, hugely offensive to other readers of the paper. And that uh, uh, guides the, the, yeah. the content of that uh, Does it edition. make you a lot of money? No, not at all. No. I, I mean, I'm, this is a very on-the-record discussion, yeah. so you're asking some really problematic mm. questions. But, yeah. uh, I, well, I've answered that yeah. one. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Um, well, let's, let's move on from uh, the journalistic scene and the, and the Post's role. We could return to that if, uh, in the question time if anybody wants to raise that with David, uh, to the issue of uh, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian relationship. And since it's so strongly in the news, I wanted to begin with the Gaza situation, desperate situation in which uh, Gaza, the people in Gaza are kind of a few days away from uh, collapse of their supplies, the collapse of electricity, all, all these things. And all this is part of a very complicated power struggle between Hamas, Fatah, and of course Israel. It's a three-cornered struggle, uh, but doesn't make what's happening in Gaza any more acceptable to be able to uh, analyze it in those terms. The question I want to ask you is this, David. Persistent uh, advice to the Israeli government from outsiders, non-Israelis, and from Israelis, including people who would not be regarded as radicals, like uh, Shaul Mafaz and Ephraim Levi, uh, that engagement with Hamas is an absolute necessity if there is to be any kind of settlement. Uh, and that uh, trying to destroy and bring down Hamas, uh, and dispose of it in some way, is a, is a fool's game. Uh, it's too strong. Um, it needs to be dealt with. It needs to be engaged with. Now, in this context, of course, we had a week or so ago an offer from a no doubt battered uh, Hamas leadership saying we want to discuss the possibility of a ceasefire. Ignored. Uh, then we had the sealing of the border. Now we've had a slight easing of that situation. This is a dangerous and brutal game. What's going on? 
Look, again, the, 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 um, the effort to do justice to, to a question that is so wide-ranging um, uh, requires uh, um, a considered and, and, and quite uh, um, lengthy reply. Um, again, similarly, uh, in many uh, respects, to South Lebanon, Israel pulled out of the Gaza Strip um, in 2005. Um, it took the army out. It uh, at tremendous uh, um, social uh, uh, traumatic cost pulled seven or eight thousand Jewish settlers out of the Gaza Strip. It relinquished control even of the narrow strip that uh, uh, separates the Gaza Strip from Egypt. Uh, and uh, the, the, this was done, but by the way, I don't think there's a single Palestinian who didn't see that as a vindication for terrorism, which is incredibly problematic, the nature of, of the disengagement. Israel was perceived to have uh, pulled back under fire. Um, and uh, there's a great debate in Israel about whether this was the right thing to do, whether this, this was the right way to, to go about that, it. But anyway, no, I, I, uh, well, let me, let me yeah, uh, yeah. because I, I, I sense that you're misunderstanding something I'm saying. I think most Israelis are pleased that Israel's not in Gaza. If, um, if you think that I was saying something to the opposite, I'm not. I think Israelis are pleased no, to be out of Gaza. I was picking you up on the idea that most Palestinians th thought it was a... A vindication of terrorism? It was vindication, not so much a vindication of terrorism, but a withdrawal under fire. Mm. <coughs> I think most, uh, well, many Palestinians, certainly, I can't really speak for them, but my understanding of it is this, saw it as a, um, as a, as a way in which Israel was reducing its responsibilities uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, and that uh, it was the prelude to a, uh, a, a, a long game of maneuvering over the future of the West Bank. Uh, I, I, so I don't think they saw it as a withdrawal under fire. But anyway, we're taking, okay. this is a byway. We, we can, we I've can, interrupted we can, you, please okay, carry on. We yeah. can agree to disagree yeah. on that. Um, the, the bottom line, though, is that Israel had left the Gaza Strip, and it had left militarily, it had left, its, it had removed its civilians, and it had removed most of it, not all of its capability, uh, um, to, to uh, de determine what would unfold there. Yeah. Um, and this was, um, certainly from my point of view, what an extraordinary opportunity. Um, here was Israel out of Gaza, pretty much uh, um, uh, back to the 67 line, um, and there was an opportunity now, surely, um, for that to serve as the uh, first um, uh, development of a different relationship, of a, a, a situation in Gaza where the Palestinians could rehouse the refugees in Gaza, could um, establish institutions of governance and so on. Uh, by the way, of course, if that had happened, not only the impact on the international community, but the impact on Israelis in terms of, ah, we can have more confidence in, in trying to go forward now uh, uh, with some kind of uh, um, effort to reach an accommodation in, in the West Bank. Uh, it didn't happen, uh, and in fact, the, the Israeli um, uh, pullback and its lack of control uh, has been abused to bring massive amounts of arms into Gaza. The, the bottom line of all the bottom lines, of course, is, is that Israel wanted, and, and we can talk about, and we can yeah. disagree on motivations and so on, Israel, Israel wanted uh, to be, to be uh, out of Gaza in the same way that it wants to be out of Lebanon. <coughs> and what's happening in the last few days is uh, only a function of uh, it being attacked from Gaza. If there were not rockets being fired, and we're at levels in, in recent days of, of 40 and 50 rockets a day on some days, um, th then the, the situation as it's been unfolding would not have been unfolding. Now, Israel does not have a good solution. It doesn't have a good fix. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't know what to do. But, but David, I mean, okay. let, me, let me put it this way. There's a history to all of these things, and, and, and that's fine to go through it. But uh, the, the, the more basic question, in my understanding of this, is that Hamas is an important and strong force. It demonstrated that by <coughs> winning an election. Uh, it demonstrated that um, in, in its conflict with Fatah, whatever you may think of that, I think it's appalling the way the two main movements in the, in the Palestinian society fell out, but that's a different matter. It's, it is a strong and important and unavoidable player. Therefore, <coughs> whatever the history and whatever the hopes that you were speaking of that turned out to be unfounded, you still have to deal with the reality that this is an important, strong part of the Palestinian seas. It cannot be wished away. And that's why, as I understand it, <coughs> senior, former senior soldiers and Mossad people are saying, we, you know, we can't wear blinkers. We've got to talk to these people. And if there is to be a settlement, and we have the broader question, which we'll turn to later, of what real chance there is for a settlement, and is the two-state possibility still alive or not, 
uh, but leaving that for a bit later, um, if there is to be any progress down that road, you cannot do it with FATA alone. You have to talk to okay. everyone. So, so uh, um, first of all, I want to um, impress uh, um, maybe upon you that the, the two people, I've, n I've not heard Shalom Afaz say that we should be talking to Hamas. I'm not saying that he hasn't said it. I have heard yeah. other ministers yeah. in government uh, along that line. And Efraim Halevi, the former head of the Mossad, has indeed, including yeah. in, in somewhat subtle terms, but quite clearly in my <laughs> newspaper recently, yeah. uh, um, uh, indicated that he thinks that the Americans, when Bush comes back to the region, I think he wrote yeah. uh, next time, maybe he should uh, uh, speak to Hamas. The consensus in Israel is that this is an organization that is avowedly committed to destroying Israel, and, and there are conditions. If, if Hamas changes its position, says, you know, we're prepared for, uh, to legitimize Israel, to accept previous agreements, and to stop terrorism, there, you know, Israel will start talking to them. That is the... Uh, um, <coughs> the position that is very broadly supported in, in Israel, I would say. But the, here's the thing, David. I mean, you're, you're the editor of a, an important newspaper. You were there a week or so ago when the ceasefire offer was made. Now, uh, the broader questions that you raise, the broader issues you raise, are, are obviously there, but um, small steps. I'm Why not, not respond? I'm not, I'm not Why the, didn't it happen? Let, uh, let me answer that. And it's yeah. one I'm not trying to answer. There's just so many other things that I, I want to yeah. say as well. Uh, the, the sense in Israel is that it's a con that uh, uh, any ceasefire, any temporary cessation will simply be abused by Hamas to rearm, the better to attack further down the road. Yeah. Uh, and one more thing that I wanted to talk to you about, about the sort of Palestinian political constellation, because I think this is important. Yeah. I personally do not believe, remember the Palestinians had parliamentary elections, and because of uh, a combination of incredibly inept performance by Fatah and other factors, yeah. Hamas won a majority in the Palestinian parliament, right? Now, you spend any time, in my opinion, you, you, you know, you, you may feel differently, it was quite obvious to me, uh, spending quite a little time uh, out in the West Bank, that Hamas was going to do really, really well in those elections. Mm. I don't think that the Palestinian public, as much as it did, it wasn't the majority, but it was it put, turned out to produce a majority. I personally don't think that they voted for Hamas because they were saying, hey, we want suicide bombings and we reject the fact of Israel's existence. I don't think they were deterred by that. They knew that that was Hamas's position. They voted for Hamas because they loathe Fatah, which they think was stealing all their money and was yeah. corrupt. Yeah. And, and the, the, you know, boy, yeah. is this complicated because you have this combination where the organization that is extraordinarily hostile to any kind of political accommodation and has a religious imperative under, underpinning it, which to my mind makes the, the situation incredibly bleak, is nonetheless, or was until relatively recently, perceived by ordinary Palestinians as exemplars of good governance. The terrible Fatah guys were stealing all their money. Well, as, right? you, as, you, as you say, in that aside, th this may be changing. Um, I, 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 well, the, the, just the yeah, last half a yeah, sentence, the yeah. point being that they then violently came to power in Gaza, and therefore I'm not sure how their reputation has been affected, although they still seem, seem to be yeah. fairly popular. Just noting as we, as we go on that there, there can be and uh, there is an argument about Hamas's real pragmatic position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the existence of Israel, and it's a very important argument. Whatever the rhetoric um, may be, there is an argument about what the real policy is or could be, and that's why uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's so important to explore every possibility uh, with Hamas, and it doesn't seem to outsiders like myself that it's happening. But let me move on. You're not allowed to, to do that and not give me the, the half a minute. 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 Simply to say that uh, um, now you're getting into uh, the, the degree to which uh, a religious imperative is underestimated or, ne or needs to be taken seriously. And I feel personally very strongly that Hamas, uh, um, its interpretation of its, uh, of, of its religion, is such that it cannot legitimize uh, a Jewish sovereign presence in the Middle East. I don't think, personally, that Hamas can, can move to different positions because that there is a, a religious interpretation in their political platform. And therefore, unlike people say, look, the PLO ostensibly moved from seeking the armed struggle to destroy Israel to seeking a two-state solution. I don't think Hamas, because of that religious imperative, is capable of making that shift. Okay, well, it's a, that's a very long and hard argument, which we've actually had in this club on previous occasions. Uh, we may re be able to return to it later in, in question time. I'd like to move on, taking my peg from what you said, in fact, about why people voted for Hamas. Um, you did, said they didn't vote against the existence of Israel. Uh, they didn't vote for Hamas's ideology or its its position on these matters. Not primarily, but they weren't deterred by it. Uh, they weren't deterred by it, but they, it wasn't their primary 
the primary reason they voted was it was a negative vote. It was a vote against Fatah's poor performance rather than a vote for Hamas. Uh, that means, uh, as I understand it, that this Palestinian majority is still essentially ready to entertain the idea of living alongside Israel in a Palestinian state, a two-state situation. You've written in one of the columns I read um, in preparation for our encounter that any form of peace process, any set of arrangements, any set of parameters will work if there is a Palestinian readiness for coexistence and if there is not, no set of parameters will work. My reaction to that is yes, but doesn't that hugely um, uh, downplay the obstacles on the Israeli side uh, to settlement? Um, doesn't it, for instance, in the light of a recent letter in the New York Review of Books, which you will know of, by various American elders, statesmen, foreign policy, Scowcroft, um, Brzezinski amongst them, saying that the outlines of the settlement, two-state settlement are clear, 1967, without major swaps, with minor swaps, which means many major evacuations, two capitals in Jerusalem, which doesn't mean four houses on the extreme outskirts, it means half the city or something approaching that, um, refugees, major compensation, and, and here on, on the Israeli side, no returns or very few returns, very, very few returns to Israel proper. Um, and they went on to say in that, uh, in that letter, addressed to the President, I think it was, that um, there would have to be Hamas and Syria involved in the negotiations. <coughs> a commentator writing about that letter said that um, this might be very, very acceptable to Abbas. It might be acceptable to Hamas, but is it acceptable to Almud and to Israel? Okay, now uh, again, you, you with your, uh, you've got this beautifully scripted question that, that goes, no, there were 25 <laughs> excellent points that I need to respond to in that. So, so I'll, I'm going to give you my opening response and then you still need to other elements of it that you, okay. that you particularly want me to comment on. I'm pessimistic about this process, not because I don't want it to work. I, uh, I want to stress that I think the, the big shift in, uh, uh, in, in mainstream Israeli thinking in the last 20 years or so is that uh, my sense is that mainstream Israel um, strongly supports uh, independent state for the Palestinians um, in large part because of the sense of, of the, the uh, imperative for Israel of yeah. Palestinian independence. The point being that Israel, uh, um, the only state with a Jewish majority in the world, wants to maintain that Jewish majority, wants to remain democratic and therefore needs to find a way to separate from the Palestinians. Yeah. Um, and and uh, um, yeah, that's, that's a pretty pow powerful imperative. There are other views as well and there are other nuances about demographics and so on that color that, that position, yeah. but yeah. I think that's a, a mainstream position. I don't think it's going to work and I don't think it's going to work because because uh, um, my sense is, and, I, and I, I have a lot of contact with the Israeli key players and less so, uh, um, although some contact with, with Palestinians and, 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 and Americans, uh, it, it is my sense that in there, and maybe I'm getting ahead of where you want mm -hmm. to go and bring me back by all means, that in the conversations that Olmert, Prime Minister Olmert and, uh, and Pierre President Abbas have been having in the last few months, Olmert came away with the sense that Hey, this, he, these are we are, we are exchangeable position they were. And the right like Camp David, which I think was initiated by Israel, Ian Clinton, Long, Barak, who was, I think that it was on, who really thought there was some friendly to be more real. It would actually be thing of Annapolis. And that what uh, Greg came clear was that Abbas was saying, uh, um, was taking conciliatory and positions in the one on ones, but the negotiations, uh, his side, were making similar positions. And therefore, we got to Annapolis, and minutes before Bush was supposed to read out that joint statement, they were still arguing about it and, and, and so on. Just let me finish this point and then, and then still. That by all means. Uh, why, do, why am I most concerned centrally about this process not working? As follows. In 2000, we understand at Camp David, Arafat, and, and this is relevant to the terms that yeah. you set out, Arafat said to Clinton something like, if I sign this deal, uh, uh, the next time you'll see me will be at my funeral. In other words, he felt that his own people would feel he had betrayed them if he signed this deal. My concern, and there, are, there is a strong argument in Israel that says Abbas is 
uh, uh, much, much more well-intentioned, shall we say, uh, uh, than Arafat, was uh, that you don't see, uh, certainly from my point of view, created on the Palestinian side any kind of atmosphere that would explain to the, ordinary, to, to the Palestinian public why their leadership should be compromising. In other words, you don't see uh, any kind of uh, uh, notion being uh, um, disseminated of legitimate Jewish as well as legitimate uh, Palestinian rights. And therefore, if Abbas were ever to come out and take any kinds of uh, remotely viable positions, he hasn't created a situation in which his own people would understand why he would be doing that, and he therefore would be in that same kind of box okay. that, that, that destroyed the, the process last time. Let's go back. For, okay, please. Let's go back to the <coughs> New York Review Books letter. If the parameters now there for a settlement were possible and acceptable to an Israeli government, I don't think Abbas would be looking at his own funeral. <coughs> But he would be looking at his own funeral, just as, uh, as Arafat saw it, um, if he signed away more, or more than a fragment more, of what that, i.e., all of the 67 bounders, minus a very small amount, half of Jerusalem. If that was on the table, my question was, after all, could, from the Israeli point of view, that be on the table? All right. Uh, let me answer that as follows. Yeah. We had um, a situation a couple of years ago, uh, uh, a little more than a couple of years ago perhaps, um, no, actually a, a couple of years ago, where um, a, a, a two-term or a two-election winning prime minister, Mr. Sharon, yeah. was gearing up to, to run for elections again, and he was heading for a massive victory. Right now, Sharon, who had become the, the very embodiment of the prime minister he had warned against, the man who had said to Israelis, grab the hilltops in Judea and Samaria so that no prime minister can relinquish this land, had wrenched the settlers out of the Gaza Strip. Now, it was not his stated overt platform that he would unilaterally, if necessary, roll from the overwhelming proportion of the West Bank, but it was widely sensed in Israel, if not understood in Israel, that if Sharon was to be re-elected for a third time, unprecedented in decades in Israel, uh, um, I'm not even sure Ben-Gurion won three on, on the trot, he certainly won uh, three or more elections, uh, sh people understood that re-electing Sharon could very probably mean, even without an agreement, uh, a pullback to something like the line of the security barrier, which is something like 7%. It, and he was going to win. Now, we have a paucity of political alternatives. I, I, I acknowledge, and you mentioned already the problematics of our electoral system. I, I, if you, you want me to digress, stop me. I think Israel is in a kind of cyclical political system where the, the, the policy that was discredited longest ago mm. uh, is, now, is now the most popular, simply because enough years have passed. Mm. And that's why, if we had elections tomorrow, Netanyahu would probably win, because Hanging Tough was discredited longer ago than negotiation, which was discredited longer ago than unilateralism. Uh -huh. And if that sounds sort of flip, and I really think that's, that's quite true. But, the point, yeah. but that's my answer to your question, you see. Yeah. Sharon, with a, with a policy that would have involved dismantling the overwhelming proportion of the settlements, without an agreement, was heading for an election victory. Now, it's, it, it's more complicated than that, but I think that's it an important answer. That. I have to say, in response to that, without wanting to get into a, a big argument in this particular area, that that is not my reading of what Sharon planned to do. Um, withdrawals, yes. Uh, maintenance of control in scores of other ways, so that uh, I, I did not see um, Sharon as uh, presenting the possibility of what a New York Review of Books team wants to see on the table. He was ready for various shifts and rearrangements, um, which would at one and the same time uh, preserve the Jewish character of Israel and leave Israel in control through a variety, of, and the devil is in the detail in these things, a whole variety of connections and uh, networks in the West Bank, whatever the legalities of much of w the West Bank and its resources. We have to differ on what, that. One sentence on that, which is I'm not suggesting that Sharon was, was ready to adopt the positions of the, of the letter that you spoke yeah. uh, of, but I also don't, I think uh, you are uh, overdoing it in the other direction. I think probably the, the, the right. truth is somewhere right. in between. Well, uh, two more questions in, in this area. I don't know how we're getting on in terms of time. We are pushing on. So, um, one is this. Uh, one is the question of the settlers. Um, in a, an interesting new book, a very interesting new book called Lords of the Land, which I've just 
read. It's an English, uh, the English publication of a book that came out in Hebrew about a year ago or two years ago. It's an account of how the settlers uh, essentially led the way. And there were no, uh, there were governmental decisions about the West Bank trailed in the wake of uh, these initiatives by these uh, very tough and forceful people. Um, the argument of the book is essentially that Israel was taken, uh, was hijacked by, uh, by settlers whose ideas and ideals most Israelis didn't share, or if they did, they shared them only in dilute form, and that this group of people had an utterly disproportionate and distorting effect on Israel and Israel's policies. And they end the book by asking the question or putting the statement that Israel was hijacked and Israel is still a hostage to its own sense. Well, it obviously overlaps with what we've just been talking about, but this is that's the question I would like to put to you. Is there truth in that description? You've been there for precisely, well, for much of the time during which this process has taken place, and you must have watched the settler situation over the years as a journalist. So what's your feeling about that? I, th I think the, the first thing to understand is that the, the opportunity to um, live the biblical heartland, uh, as, it, as it's seen, um, of, of the Jewish nation was a post-67 reality. And remember, when the State of Israel was refounded in 48, there was a big debate among uh, Orthodox Jews as to whether it was somehow <laughs> blasphemous to be reviving the state before the Messiah had come, and some threw in their lot with the state, and some became among its most hostile and adversaries, still are, and yeah. still are, and you, yeah. you, know, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. In 67, when Israel improbably uh, um, captured so much territory, there was an, a, a sense in a, a part of um, that demographic that this was proof that they had made the right decision to throw in a lot with the secular Zionist pioneers because this was God liberating uh, a biblical land. And among Israelis who, uh, who may have seen all kinds of objections to that, I also think there was a, somewhere there was some kind of gnawing, gnawing sympathy for that mindset. Uh, Shimon Peres, who is a fairly prominent Israeli dove, was certainly uh, outflanking Yitzhak Rabin to the right. Uh, uh, in, in the um, in the mid 70s, when Labour was uh, was in government, uh, to the to the to the uh, support of the settlers. So uh, um, that that's the context I think that uh, um, that, I, that I wanted to point out. T to come to the present situation, first of all, and, and I and I would stress that the settlements in Gaza were the furthest from the Israeli consensus. Nonetheless, in uh, 2005 over the, the disbelieving objections of the settlement movement. They didn't think it was going to happen. They did not believe it was going to happen. Yeah. Israel dismantled uh, um, the settlement blocks of the Gaza Strip. Um, now, I stress it, why do I say the, the thing about the consensus? Because it's relevant. This is, these were not settlements in, the, in Hebron and in Shiloh and in places that uh, mm. have, have a biblical resonance and that are closer physically also to the borders of sovereign Israel. Mm. And therefore, you might say, well, that doesn't necessarily prove anything. And I can't tell you the answer to that. Mm. I can tell you that when I last interviewed the Prime Minister, he spoke as though he weren't the Prime Minister. And he said, you know, I don't think the Palestinians would have been making such a fuss about Har Choma and Ma'ale Adumim, Har Choma uh, within the Israeli expanded sovereign borders of Jerusalem, uh, certainly West Bank territory uh, um, from the Palestinians' point of view, Ma'ale Adumim, the biggest of the settlements uh, mm. to the east of Jerusalem. He said, the Prime Minister, you know, if it had only been those two, I don't think the Palestinians would be making such a fuss, but every year in every settlement there is growth. And he, he, he has spoken as though uh, he's, he's to a degree helpless. Right? So you have on the one hand, hey, we pulled out of Gaza, uh, but you're um, very much speaking to my point. Right. <coughs> so, so let me just Israeli politicians saying we're on a train which we're not driving. Yeah, so, so let me it's sum, a very old story. Right, so let me sum that up. <coughs> uh, um, my, my sense, that's all I can give you. My sense is, and, I, and this is very central, uh, I, I think Israelis are desperate for an accommodation. We haven't talked about Syria yet, and I'm sure we will, but if, if Bashar Assad, who may or may not be the ruler of Syria for another 50 years or another five minutes, mm. uh, for whom a deal involves relinquishing the Golan Heights. If Bashar Assad came to Jerusalem like Sadat did 30 years ago and said, I want to make peace, 
the, the pressure in Israel to engage would be overwhelming. The uh, pressure in Israel to find some kind of accommodation, again, emphasized by the fact that Sharon was going to win an election without an accommodation uh, uh, and was heading towards further unilateralism, gives me the sense that if there was a real feeling in Israel that this is for real, that the Palestinians are going into this with their eyes open, that they are genuinely legitimizing Jewish sovereignty and a partnership and reconciliation. And this is part of a move towards widespread normalization and Israel achieving that stated aim in the Declaration of Independence to, to good neighborliness on every frontier. It is my sense that an accommodation would be viable. And one last point on that. When Barak came back from Camp David, having uh, apparently, again, there was no one taking notes, so nobody knows for sure, been prepared to take much more far-reaching, compromising positions, certainly than the Israeli public thought, there was, there was no outburst of hysterical opposition in Israel. Uh, these are speculative uh, mm -hmm. answers that I'm giving you, but that, that's my sense. Well, uh, we shouldn't get into Camp David, because that is a whole evening. But all, of, week all of these. On its own. Um, the, the, but that would not be my interpretation of Camp David or of the whole process or, or all indeed of Tabor and everything that followed. Uh, Tabor maybe would, fo would fall into the category. By then it was too about. late. By then it was too late. Well, I'm going to ask, uh, end by asking the most, uh, end this part of the, our discussion by asking you the, the most fundamental question. Is the two-state solution um, still alive? <coughs> Or is the prospect either of the one state solution that the vast majority of Israelis don't want, vast majority, and the majority of Palestinians perhaps do not want, who knows, either a one state solution or enmity for as long as we can see into the future, in which an embattled Israel, uh, not any forced into uh, by its own choices to some extent, um, into uh, a continued state of siege with all that that will, uh, that will mean in terms of internal freedoms, in terms of the relationship between Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs, in terms of democracy. That's the question. People have said that if there isn't a viable Palestinian state, there won't be a viable Jewish state. I, I, you bring me back to the, to the point I made earlier, that the, the mainstream in Israel certainly sees an imperative from Israel's point of view in uh, a separation from the Palestinians in a state for the Palestinians alongside Israel. Um, so the answer that mainstream Israel would give you would, would, would be, we really hope so. Um, that furthermore, the, 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 it's, it's hard to tell uh, from opinion polls and so on about Palestinian positions, which sometimes appear to show widespread support for a two-state solution, but at the same time uh, um, show overwhelming support for a refugee quote-unquote right of return, which is not a two-state solution. That's in Israel. That becomes Palestinian as well. Uh, Israelis would hope that there is room for a two-state solution. Condoleezza Rice, to my understanding, one last sentence, then come back to me by all means, uh, um, when she was recently in Israel, uh, was asking Israelis, do you know any Palestinians under 40 who still support a two-state solution, and, and was apparently getting uh, long silences. And, and uh, people, prominent Israeli politicians who are dovish, um, have recently said to me that they uh, are increasingly pessimistic about whether even the uh, um, people who they consider to be moderate are seriously seeking a two-state solution or, or feel that the status quo is bad for Israel, that time is on the side of the Palestinians, that the demographics are working in their favor and so on. Fine. So you obviously feel the window is closing. Yeah, I, th I think the window is closing, yeah. Um, well, that moves... And that's bad. There'd be, no, there be no doubt about it. It is by it's, it's not definition good. bad. Yes. Uh, except, I suppose you might say that if, if that if that solution, which has been the solution in everybody's mind, it rhetorically there for a very long time, pursued practically um, with some limited success from time to time, if that solution disappears, we will be in a new situation, and that new situation may bring new possibilities. Please, please just give me one sentence yeah. back of that. The, the, I want to, again, you, you may not agree with me, but it's important to me that, that, I, that I make this clear because I think I reflect uh, um, um, middle ground in Israel here. I think Israelis, their only caveat, essentially, for Palestinian statehood, I mean, this is a great big yeah. generalization, is that it not come at the expense of Israel. Now, all kinds of nuances and so on, but that's the bottom line, because they share that sense that the opportunity is passing, that time is not on Israel's side, and, and so on. 
Well, I would just have one sentence back to you, and then it's, it's, it's often struck me uh, in when, when in Israel, the expectation that a solution or a settlement will settle everything is one of the problems, that it will write off the whole history of conflict, difficulty, and blood between the two peoples. Uh, history wouldn't stop if there were a two-state solution. History wouldn't stop if there were a one-state solution. Um, these demographics which Israel fears would continue to operate transnationally. Um, both peoples are going to have to adjust to the tendencies we can all see on the landscape. The political framework, in a sense, it's like your remark about the parameters, the political framework will not insulate Israel from these changes, except temporarily um, and up to a limited point. They will continue to happen. Okay, but if you, if you can manage to find a solution that is viable, that does not, from the Israeli point of view, a solution that does not spell the end of Israel, you create a reality, hopefully, where the, the nature of that uh, um, unfolding partnership changes the wider realities. That's what, you know, that has to be what's at stake here. That, come back to May 2000, why was there such optimism in Israel, there really was, that there could be a, an accord here because there was banal interaction between ordinary people. Uh, there were lots of Palestinians working in Israel. It wasn't equal interaction. But yeah. there, were, there were hundreds of thousands, of, 200,000 Palestinians working in Israel. Israelis were going to the dentist in the West Bank, for goodness sake. You don't go, you know, you, go, you don't go to the dentist who, who you don't trust. That was an extraordinary thing. Israelis were going to the dentist in Bethlehem. Uh, and therefore, that kind of reality, you, you have to hope if yeah. you're achieving a solution. It's the only way you can achieve a solution. And that kind of reality means that other forces start to change. That has to be the hope. Okay, let's move on to uh, our last two main areas. One we'll deal with rather briefly because we're running out of time. It's a very interesting area, and it's an area that David has written about, and that is the, um, the problems of Israeli society now. Uh, early Israel was hugely romanticized, um, wasn't uh, a socialist. It certainly wasn't as equal as people imagined. On the other hand, um, the signs of social problems in Israel today are quite widespread, falling voter turnout, um, crime, falling educational standards, about which David has written very passionately, um, uh, growing inequality. Now, these are tendencies that uh, uh, you can see in developed societies uh, everywhere. But still, this is not uh, what Israelis thought Israel was supposed to be like. And one of David's most recent columns, well, relatively recent, last year was about the knifing of a young uh, basketball player after practice in Jerusalem, I think it was, uh, not by an Arab or Arabs, not by uh, uh, criminals, uh, but by knife-wielding other Jewish kids, uh, something that's uh, on the rise in Israeli cities. It may still be relatively, um, relatively <laughs> limited by, uh, by, perhaps by British standards and certainly by American standards. Still, it's... Uh, it's bad news, and such uh, social trends interact with the political difficulties we've been talking about because an uninformed and violent uh, element in society, um, you know, reduces the chances of rationality in all kinds of decisions. So I'm going to ask you, David, what is your view about the moral health of your society? Look, we, we are living in a, a very difficult region, and we um, have not had the luxury of um, flourishing in all the fields that we would have wanted to flourish in. And, and you, as you rightly say, you're quoting from some of the things that I have wrote, so, so boy do I feel this keenly. Um, my eldest son was not in school for two months uh, recently because there was a teacher strike, which goes to the uh, underfunding in the education system. Um, you, you've accurately... Uh, um, relayed that incident that I, that I wrote about, about the stabbing. Um, I mean, you, you, again, you, you, you um, brought up many factors here. Uh, there is uh, a growing alienation from um, the political system, but, but let's keep all of these things in proportion, because our growing alienation, for example, from the political system still gives us a voter turnout that is massively higher, I imagine, than, than 
an awful lot of democracies. I don't want to rank it yeah, uh, yeah. inaccurately, but we're, you know we have turnouts in the in the in the mid and high 60 percent and so on. Um, there is crime, but again, as you as you uh, rightly say, I, I think it's probably relatively low. This was you know why did I write about this incident in Jerusalem? Because it's not every week or even every month that, that kids get uh, stabbed by by fellow kids in uh, in Jerusalem neighborhoods. Um, we have challenges, and, and, and some of them are a function of, uh, of, of, of the strains in the region. The, what, what to me is worth highlighting as well is how improbably resilient, nonetheless, Israeli society is. And by the way, the economic uh, disparities are, are, are very problematic. We, uh, uh, I think America has a wider uh, gap between the top and bottom, uh, 10%, but Israel is uh, getting there. Is getting there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, uh, when, when you are having trouble feeding your family, uh, um, detracts from your resilience as a civilian. And re civilian resilience in Israel is, I think, um, taken for granted and, um, uh, and not sufficiently uh, noted. Mm. Again, we, we, um, uh, we've discussed some of the, uh, the surrounding context, but the fact is that in 2002, 2003, um, leaving home in Jerusalem was to enter a kind of grisly lottery. Um, and you didn't know if the people you cared about were at home again in the evening. You knew that every day people were trying to kill you, and about once a week a bus or was, blow up. was, was yeah. blown up. Yeah. And the, the sensible thing to do <coughs> is go and live somewhere else. Which many did. But, but not, uh, not in a decisive uh, uh, stream. Yes, some people did and other people came. And that's, um, I, I don't want to be sanguine about this, and I'm not. I think there's a, uh, everything has its limits. Uh, but I think despite the, the problems which we, which I highlight, which uh, other journalists highlight in Israel, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's and, and given the, the climate, it's an extraordinarily resilient society. And yeah, it's not as perfect as, uh, as we'd all want all of our societies to be. Okay, fair mm. enough. Well, we'll turn finally now, David, to the, the broader region. Um, and it's a, a landscape of confrontation. It's a landscape of confrontation between a pole at one end uh, of Tehran <coughs> and at the other of uh, Israel and the United States and to some extent the more conservative Arab governments. Um, it's a confrontation that many people feel has been pumped up beyond uh, what's wise um, and, and, and that it's, it's, it's counterproductive to let our understanding, and I, when I say our, I mean people in the region as well as people outside, our understanding of what is going on and what are the possibilities for peace or at least coexistence, um, and I'm speaking more generally now than just, uh, and just Israelis and Palestinians, um, we're seeing them in the wrong kind of framework. This is, this is a the mood in which I'm going to put this question or a couple of questions to you. It's, history suggests that it's seriously productive to try and keep uh, rising powers down and Iran is unavoidably a rising power. It's got strengths that uh, can't be wished away. Um, it, it, it is reaching out for a stronger and bigger role in the region. Uh, in my view, uh, whatever one's attitude towards the Iranian government, and that's a whole complex argument on its, uh, of its own, um, it just isn't practical to try and um, keep an in a box. Um, you, I've read some pretty sharp things you've said on Iranian matters, so let's begin with the most obvious one, the Iranian bomb. Now, nobody thinks that an Iranian bomb would be fortunate development, and I think that nobody uh, would include many people in Iran as well. But nevertheless, um, the spectrum of reaction to an Iranian bomb runs from people who think it would be unfortunate but containable, um, that it wouldn't lead, it wouldn't seriously increase the possibility of nuclear exchange, it probably wouldn't lead to proliferation in the sense of other countries in the region acquiring nuclear weapons, it certainly wouldn't lead to a nuclear war between Iran and Israel, although it would affect the power balance between Iran and Israel, because it would make it more difficult for certain things to happen between the two countries. It would be a kind of deterrent. Um, others think if it happens, it's Armageddon. Now, 
on that spectrum, where do you stand? Closer to the Armageddon, guys. Um, tell me why. You'll, you'll not be surprised to hear, and I'm sorry to say. Um, first of all, the, the, you said it about Hamas and you said it about Iran, the notion yeah. that because organizations are, or countries are, are gaining, or regimes, sorry, organizations or regimes are gaining power, um, I, I, you didn't say therefore, to, in, in the case of you said we have to engage. There are some trends that I think um, do not necessitate engagement because they are so dangerous. And I, um, I, I think the notion of uh, um, uh, ideologies of, uh, of personal jihad, organizations and regimes that are championing that kind of extremist ideology are, never mind Israel, this is, this is the challenge to, to the free world uh, and, and engagement is, uh, or conciliatory engagement um, is not going to work. The, con the concern, let me, let me first of all, um, to be helpful here, if we have the whole Israeli cabinet up here, I think maybe one. We'll, 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 <laughs> God. There's nothing a lot of them, actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, rather more than perhaps we need. Yeah. Um, uh, there's maybe one or two who would say uh, Iran's, uh, Iran is uh, um, going to get a bomb, it's a fait accompli, and we have to um, ensure that our second strike, uh, alleged second strike capability, uh, is such as to ensure that they would never be tempted to use it. That, does, that argument does not play to the mainstream and to the majority of the political spectrum in Israel. Um, because the combination of, of this uh, in Iran's um, weaponry uh, is, is seen as foes. There's um, that because the regime may be less pragmatic than one would desperately hope it would and more particularly apocalyptic, that it might actually use that um, uh, at tremendous cost, at unthinkable cost, uh, would nonetheless be um, student, um, key players or are in the regime that, would, that they would use this and, and uh, inaugurate Armageddon because of a conviction that this will usher in some kind of glorious new dawn. But even, and, and I've heard you know, people argue that for, for this Iranian regime, the notion of mutual assured destruction, of course, kept Americans and the Soviet Union from destroying yeah. each other in the Cold War. For this Amer Iranian regime, it's not a deterrent, it's a positive inducement. Right, that is the, 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 the most troubled uh, assessment. But short of that, there's the concern that Iran might be tempted to supply such a capability to a third party, to a, an organization rather than a, a, a state. And there's, even short of that, the feeling, uh, the consensual feeling in Israel, that uh, Iran with a bomb would uh, psychologically, economically, this regime, I stress, this regime with that bomb, uh, with its attitude to Israel, uh, would be devastating for Israel without having to press the button. Well, I'll come back to you on two fronts. Okay. Okay. One is this, that um, uh, some would say that um, what you've just said amounts to a serious misreading of the Iranian character. Iranians are not <coughs> themselves suicidal, and this is a relatively rational regime, relatively rational regime. Dinajad's rhetoric notwithstanding. Um, that brings one to the point that in the past Israel and Iran have been in a discreet way allies, that there remain, despite everything, despite the Islamic Revolution, certain commonalities. One of them is that this is an established state regime which is not very interested in giving any space to what we call non-state actors. Same for Israel. Um, that there, there are some grounds to suggest that as part of a broader bargain involving the United States, there could be a reconciliation of Iranian and Israeli aspirations in the region, which brings me to the second point. There are others who would say that Israel's real problem with Iran is that its, its growth, the growth in its power, and in particular if that took on a nuclear aspect, would threaten a hegemony over the region, which Israel has come to take for granted and regards a right. And that until, and this perhaps should be our final question before we let some chances, perhaps Israel has to give up this idea that it has to be entirely on top and that nobody who could upset it or cross its will in any serious way should be allowed to, you know, be in that situation. So the two, two connected points. The, the, um, the, your second point takes us back to something that I said before about um, 
Israel feeling when you asked me about is there, is there no military solution and so on. The, 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 the sense at the moment in Israel, and I think for the foreseeable future, is that the region is so hostile and Israel's geographic and demographic realities are so problematic that it feels very strongly that holding a decisive military edge is the only reason that it still exists. Um, the, the, the other point that I, that I really want to stress, because uh, uh, I'm sure certain memories are stirred, is that don't think that Israel believes that the ideal preferred uh, um, uh, denouement now is that there's some kind of military intervention. In, in 1981, Israel, um, uh, in a surprise attack over distances that it was not known to have been able to fly, um, took out Saddam's reactor at Osirak, which was yeah. a single facility with no defenses, and, and uh, they, could all, and they, they couldn't really retaliate. Israel is acutely conscious that none of those factors apply in the case of Iran. There's no element of surprise. There are multiple facilities. They're well protected. They can be re rebuilt, and they, and they can retaliate. The, the strong sense in Israel, and it goes back to the very first thing you said about, I think you said something like most people would agree that a, a nuclear Iran is you know, not, a, not this regime is not, uh, not a very good thing, or I don't want to miss misrepresent mm. what you said, something like that. Um, well, I would say that, that any country acquiring nuclear weapons in the current situation, whether it's Iran or anywhere else, is not a good idea. Okay. We have too many already. Well, the, anyway. the, 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 uh, um, the feeling in Israel is that that weaponry with this regime is so potentially uh, um, problematic, not just for Israel, but, uh, but much further afield as well. Remember, Iran is developing missile capabilities. It's got Israel well within range already, and it is still developing. Uh, longer and longer uh, range missiles and so on. Um, that the, the sanctions effort has to succeed. Uh, there's a, there's a, a degree of bafflement in Israel that nations that are saying, um, that, that, that are making the most uh, acute arguments about we well, have to avoid military intervention and so on, by dragging their feet on sanctions, I'm, th I'm thinking of Russia and China, are <coughs> gradually creating a situation where either you have the fait accompli or uh, military uh, intervention. Military yeah. intervention from Israel's point of view, I just want to stress that, is not, uh, uh, is not anything that Israel wants to see happening. It, it doesn't quite understand why the international community doesn't want to uh, try and encourage this regime to uh, abandon the nuclear weapons drive. And by the way, there's no, there's no notion in Israel that Iran is seeking a nuclear capability for anything other than uh, the purpose of nuclear weaponry. Uh, there may be other people outside who disagree, but in Israel... You mean um, for civil purposes? Yeah, that, I mean, that is just uh, um, not, not a notion that is taken seriously. But Israel, I mean, sorry, Iran could be seeking uh, nuclear capacity or uh, just below the horizon nuclear capacity, uh, I, not quite the bomb, the bomb within three weeks kind of capacity for reasons of prestige and to affect the power balance in the region, which gets us back to that question of how how and when should states accommodate without bringing the word appeasement in, because that opens up a whole thing. There are such things as realities. And there is such a thing as having a habit of being, as I said, a habit of being militarily dominant, which may, in my view, should and must be abandoned if, uh, if the future is to be at all hopeful. All right, so I, I think we, we kind of circled around a little bit on that, and, and you and I obviously you know, disagree on that, which okay. is a pretty well, central and serious issue, so it's probably well, we not okay, but we, we'll have to agree. We disagree on a number of things, and we've agreed on a few. And I think we should stop agreeing and disagreeing and allow some people from the audience to talk. Talk through me, say who you are, and the usual things. Keep it concise, and questions rather than statements. I'll begin on the left. <laughs> this gentleman. Thank you very much for a fascinating uh, discussion. My name is Mike Barnes, and the question I wanted to ask is whether within Israel the hostility that you mentioned particularly just now among the uh, in the region towards Israel, um, whether Israel can go on um, if you like, accepting that hostility without seeing that part at least of it arises because of Israel's treatment of the Palestinians. You've only got to talk to Muslims in this country or even ordinary people in this country to see that that has a major impact on Israel's um, reputation, if you like. Okay. Yeah, um, the, the, I mean, I've covered an awful lot of this ground already, but, but maybe there's Maybe I can, I can usefully answer you by giving you a sense of how 
briefly a sense of, of, of how Israel regards this evolving reality. Uh, it feels that there was supposed to be a Jewish entity and an Arab entity that were established when, when the British mandate was, uh, uh, um, was divided. And Israel, which is marking its 60th anniversary next year, should theoretically have, have been marking it alongside an Arab entity's 60th anniversary. Uh, the feeling is that for the first quarter century of, uh, of Israel's existence, when Israel did not control the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, um, the, those who spoke for the Palestinians did not seek coexistence, but sought to eliminate Israel. And therefore, um, there is tremendous wariness, to put it mildly, about relinquishing territory from which Israel uh, was existentially attacked. The sense, moreover, is that at the end of the 80s, when for the first time the Palestinian leadership ostensibly uh, was prepared to abandon the armed struggle and agree to a two-state solution, well, Israeli consensual Israel feels it elected Yitzhak Rabin and it tried to reach an agreement with the Palestinians and th that agreement and of course I'm giving you the Israeli narrative I stress but you were asking me about how Israelis feel um, that, that that process which was majority supported that's why Rabin uh, was elected was destroyed by terrorism and ultimately and you've, you've made clear uh, and there are conflicting narratives about Camp David ultimately felled uh, at Camp David where in the Israeli narrative Yasser Arafat was not prepared uh, to do a viable deal with Israel uh, and we're now in a reality where even more so, where the sense in Israel is that we want independent statehood for the Palestinians more than they do. And that if we could only reach uh, terms which would not threaten Israel's very survival, hey, we were about to elect a prime minister who was going to do it pretty much without an agreement. Okay. So, you know, that would be how the, the, the Israeli sense of it. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> this gentleman in the blue shirt. <laughs> My name is Eugene O'Donovan, and I kind of question on your website, which, which is um, geoforce.com. And like all websites, it's got a number of tabs across the top and so on, the menus. And um, one says, um, Jewish world and the business from this world. And the rest of the tabs are news and sports as well. But I was wondering why, um, since the since more indigenous population I've seen in the Muslims, why does the website have the Muslims? Well, uh, we covered some, I mean, the, the, I don't know if everyone could hear the question okay. We, uh, could you hear the question? I'll, I'll, I'll summarize it and you'll tell me if I did justice to it. it uh, we have tabs on the top of the website which promote different products that, uh, and different aspects of the post coverage. One, one, one relates to Jewish world coverage, one relates to Christian world coverage. We don't have a particular uh, edition um, that uh, is aimed at the Muslim world. By the way, we don't have a particular edition that is coming out in Hebrew. Um, we are... I want, I want to um, just yeah, yeah. go back to the very first question that you asked me about the paper. Uh, and, and it's a great privilege to, to be here and to be taken very seriously. And I, uh, our, our newspaper resonates a great deal now. But let me just impress upon you that until, unlike uh, um, most newspapers around the world, the, the web for the Jerusalem Post uh, has changed our reality in a quite a dramatic way. This used to be a, the Hebrew word is curios, like a little strange English language publication in Hebrew speaking Israel, um, which never sold more than a few tens of thousands, mm. and all of a sudden got liberated uh, um, by the web and is now read by vast numbers of people online. We, we do, however, have incredibly limited resources. Uh, again, since this conversation is on the record, uh, I don't want to go into to the details, but I can say that me being here is somewhat troubling for me. Uh, and I would be very happy for us to do, the, the, now come back to your question, I'd be very happy to, for us to do uh, um, uh, other editions, um, and I'd be very happy for us to cater more widely. I would love to. We don't have correspondence in Beirut, in Damascus, in Amman, I know, uh, uh, and in Cairo, um, but I'd like to have them. There are some places where we wouldn't be able to. There are some places where we would be able to, we but it's a matter it. of, uh, of resources. But we concentrate on the areas that we uh, um, well, we believe that there is the most sense at the moment, but I would love us to, to, to give wider coverage and in, and in different languages as well. Ah, well, no, but we're, but we're an English language uh, newspaper. You know, that's, there are other publications that come out in Arabic. There are lots of publications that come out in Hebrew. Yes, but they have to be able. But, but, but well, most uh, of yeah, the, let me just cut yeah, through this. I'm sure that the Jerusalem Post uh, in Israel has Israeli, Arab, Muslim, and Christian readers. The, the people who are English, English yeah. and, and read the, the newspaper because it's of interest to them. So I think the, the, the point is made. Could I have some more arms? 
about this young lady here in black? Hi, my name is Otta Faginson, and um, just want to thank you very much for coming. I'm a big fan of the paper. Since this is a, a, a talk sponsored by a media organization, I actually wanted to ask you about um, your views on the media coverage of Israel, particularly here in Europe, which is, seems to always to get very quick. Um, so it's very quick to blame Israel on anything that goes wrong. I mean, case in point, what's going on in Gaza right now, where even President Hosni Mubarak is saying that the um, attacks, the uh, the attacks in Jashar Road are actually very much part to blame for what's happening right now in the in Gaza. Okay, David, tough question. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of all of yours were so nice. So, you know. <laughs> I'm really not complaining, actually. Um, look, uh, uh, in, in a way, you, you are um, pushing at a somewhat open door, although I don't claim um, absolute expertise. I live in Jerusalem. I don't read um, all the European newspapers every day. I, I, I don't speak good enough French to read the French newspapers, even if I did have the time. Uh, I see a little bit. We see uh, BBC. We see CNN. We see Al Jazeera uh, in English. Um, my, and I don't want to, uh, to generalize. I do think, um, um, having said I don't want to generalize, I'll, I'll have to generalize a little bit. Uh, I think there's a, a lack of uh, context often and a lack of uh, um, appreciation when, when media is being played. Um, for example, when you have conflicts between open and closed societies and an open society is allowing its uh, um, victimhood and its offensive capability to be uh, um, seen and a closed society is only allowing its victimhood. This distorts uh, um, the, um, the, the situation that, or the impression that, that well-meaning people get. And I sometimes expect, would expect more from uh, um, people in the media who I feel are sometimes being uh, manipulated. Uh, I also think uh, the fact that I'm here, um, I, I don't take that for granted. I think you, you guys gave me an opportunity to, uh, uh, to give an Israeli's uh, narrative and, and Israeli's understanding. I think that's incredibly important. I would urge uh, um, people to, to find out more, to, to read more widely, to, to come and see things for themselves. Um, I, I feel that uh, uh, Israel, uh, I, think, I think reasonable people often get uh, erroneous impressions about um, our reality based on, uh, um, on, on some of the media and, uh, and therefore no shortage, uh, uh, um, no, no, no um, substitute for first-hand information. And one last thing, um, I think it's not insignificant that there were sort of boycott efforts here in the last few months, which were not successful, in the fields of academia and journalism. And I don't think that's coincidental, and I think that's pernicious. Uh, these are disciplines that are dedicated to uh, contact and dissemination of information and uh, enabling people to, to be empowered by access to information. And, and I think that there is uh, a, um, a message there that people are trying to close down access to information. And why would they do that? Well, I think the more information that you have, the, the more, uh, uh, the fairer the sense you'll get of our reality. I have to interject a question of my own here, if, if you questioners can wait a little, because what you said connects with something important that happened here in Britain at the Oxford Union, where um, a debate uh, on uh, the future of Israelis and Palestinians was effectively derailed or at least damaged by um, long distance intervention. Now, I think that intervention began in the columns of your paper, or at least um, it was Alan Dershowitz's uh, attack on the idea of including Norman Finkelstein in the debate, even though he was speaking in favor of. Um, uh, the continued existence of a Jewish state and against a uh, one-state proposition. Um, we felt, or many people in Britain felt, that was um, too long a spoon um, to interfere in admittedly student politics and student debate in that way. I may be wrong about that are originating in your columns, but perhaps you can... Uh, look, I don't, honestly don't know the yeah. incident you're talking about. I know, for example, I think there's something scheduled for tomorrow. By, uh, by at, 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 No, at the Oxford um, right. debate in which the, the motion is, um, does Israel have a right to exist? And the people speaking both for and against are known to be, shall we put this delicately, uh, hardly Israel's most enthusiastic supporters. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, generally speaking, would say, I repeat what I said, give, you know, have access to information that is fairly presented. Well, I, you see, I, 
for the, 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 the business of everyone. But I think that you, uh, and I think you facilitated a, a genuine, and I think we both will convey our views, and that's useful. I think if you, if you skew a debate, if you uh, ought to be giving a, a wide representation and aren't, if you mislead people, and I don't, I'm not talking about the specific case that you're talking about because yeah. I don't know about it, yeah. then you're doing a disservice, then you're reinforcing uh, the misconceptions. Well, that's a position we can absolutely share. Okay, sorry. Um, let me look around. The lady at the back with blonde hair or red hair? Blondish red hair. <laughs> Reddish blonde hair. I don't know red hair, but um, I wanted to ask you how, you talked at great length about how Israel is a democratic state. And I wanted to know how you reconcile um, Israel being a democratic state with Israel not feeling that it doesn't have to comply with international law, most notably the ruling by the International Court of Justice that it should dismantle the wall, and uh, the conclusions that were um, decided upon in coming to that ruling, which was that East Jerusalem should go to the Palestinians, that Israel should withdraw back to the 1967 borders um, and, uh, and that it should dismantle the settlements in the West Bank. Why as a democratic state is, should Israel not be held to international rulings? And why as a democratic state is Israel allowed to punish the Palestinian civilians in Gaza in order to obtain it's getting a bit too broad. Let's let's confine it right. to the okay, so it to the to the international court. Why, why why does Israel? Yeah, I think I think there are caveats and, and nuances in uh, in the the laws that you're referring to. I'll come to the security barrier in a second that don't require Israel uh, to commit national suicide, and it would like to be able to find a, a means of survival. Uh, um, and believes that international law would uh, back it up in finding uh, a viable. Uh, accommodation that uh, um, resolves the dispute with the Palestinians without uh, a national suicide. On the issue of the, um, what I prefer to call the security barrier because only in a, a small proportion of it is a wall, most of it is a series of fences. Um, the, the, uh, um, uh, first of all, to, to stress um, in terms of human rights, it is undoubtedly impacting um, Palestinian rights for people who had, say, homes on one side and, and schools on the other and so on. Uh, I think the greatest human right is the right to life, uh, and I think it is not a exaggerated um, statistical assertion that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of Israelis who are alive today who would otherwise be dead uh, if this barrier hadn't been built. Um, yes, the, the International uh, um, Court of Justice uh, ruled uh, on, on that in a way that Israel interpreted to be denying it the right to self-defense. Um, uh, 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 an absolutely uh, um, central international right. However, Israel has its own Supreme Court. Uh, and I think I mentioned that uh, Sharon was heading for an election in which perhaps 7%, he would have withdrawn perhaps to the security barrier, which takes in about 7% of the West Bank. The original uh, route of the uh, um, security barrier was going to take in about 14% of the West Bank. It was uh, formulated by the security establishment that wanted to bring as many Israelis within its uh, uh, reach as possible. Well, uh, uh, Palestinians have the uh, legal right to apply to the Supreme Court in Israel, and there, were, there have been a series of petitions, which is why uh, in 2008 um, much of the security barrier has still not been completed, and why, um, and as, as a consequence of those appeals to the Supreme Court, the barrier has been moved um, um, westward to the point where it is now uh, taking in some 7% of the West Bank. So Israel uh, has shown at its highest legal lef levels uh, a willingness to uh, compromise uh, its ideal security requirements for a defensive barrier uh, because of an awareness of, uh, of humanitarian concerns, um, which I, I think is, which, well, which, uh, which I'm, I'm happy to have detailed to you. Well, um, uh, um, Rada. Thank you. Rada um, Khan. Um, Thank you for presenting to us, I think very well, the Israeli narrative. Um, and therefore my question is going to be to, if you like, challenge that narrative and see what you have to say. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to avoid the temptation of treating you as if you were the state of Israel. 
So, um, first of all, a very quick thing, which I wasn't meant to say, but, but, but I can't avoid, which was about the Oxford Union and the question of the boycott and so on. I must say very quickly about that. Rada was involved in that. I was involved in the first one, and I'll be involved in the one tomorrow, taking place at Oxford. Uh, and I have to say, there really was a lot of interference with the first debate uh, because of pro-Israel um, bodies, organizations, and individuals who wanted to actually interfere with that debate. And we felt that was an interference with free speech. And the same uh, forces are trying to do something about tomorrow's debate, but uh, as far as I know, it's going ahead. So the boycott issue is not simple, and it's not a question of saying we're going to prevent people from saying anything. Uh, what it's doing is sending a message uh, to Israel and to Israeli civil society that uh, is, is the Israeli government policy against the Palestinians is not acceptable, and it has to be something like it's a, it's a message, really. Anyway, to, to my main point, I noticed in your presentation you have uh, talked, you've used the word terrorism quite freely uh, with relation to the Palestinians. And I'm wondering, first of all, is there any awareness, as far as you know, on the part of Israeli society that um, if you uh, occupy a people and if you uh, uh, employ punitive measures against them, and if you do to them what is being done to the people of Gaza, they have a right to resist those policies. Now, a, only a very small percentage of Palestinian action could be described as one against civilians, i.e. terrorism. And a lot of that resistance uh, is one against uh, the military, against soldiers, and so on. Like the whole thing is called terrorism in Israel. So I'm asking you, does anybody not understand that if you occupy people, if you oppress them, if you deprive them of freedom, they are going to resist, and that is a legitimate choice in international law. And my second uh, issue, or my second question, yeah, sorry, uh, let me just try and be as quick as I can, well, because it's very important what you have to say, and I find it very interesting. Um, you talked okay. about, or you gave, the, you gave the impression that Israel is longing for an accommodation, a peaceful accommodation. I think you used the word desperate in relation to Syria. And you've also talked about a majority that wants to see a Palestinian state. Again, I'm wondering how many people in Israel understand that. From the outside, our perception is that Israel may well indeed want peace, but only on its own terms. That is, it might want to have peace with Syria as long as it gets to parts of the Golan. It, it might want to have a Palestinian state as long as it keeps the parts of the West Bank and most and from the whole of East Jerusalem. Okay. Is right. there any awareness that, okay, right. that that is the case? It's a big, a big, it's so a just, big, big just, question. Just the one or, one or two little well, points there. I mean, the perception is critical here, you see. Um, to, to, to quickly take uh, um, some of your points, the, uh, when I was talking about Israeli desperation for an accommodation with Syria, and I was speculating as to how the country might respond if Assad came to Jerusalem, I say that in full awareness that peace with Syria and accommodation with Syria would require relinquishing the Golan Heights. When I talk about, yes, the Golan Heights, yes. I, I mean, I didn't, I, I stress, this, this is a speculative assessment of the Israeli national mood. Uh, I think the word desperation, I would apply it also to the Israeli desire for an accommodation with the Palestinians. And Martin and I already disagreed about what Sharon might have been prepared to do and so on. And I have, you know, I've conveyed my sense of what uh, um, Israel would be prepared to do. Um, Israel's finished with Gaza as far as it wanted to be concerned. It's not interested in, in oppressing anybody in Gaza. There is now a hostile regime in Gaza that is firing from civilian areas into, civilian, in, into Israeli civilian areas. But Israel has no interest in, in anything in Gaza. Israel wants, wants the line to be honored on both sides, and that's the end of it. Um, the, the issue of, of, of debates and boycotts, Israel doesn't need the message. Israel is desperate to partner the Palestinians towards an accommodation. And, and you know why you should take this seriously? Because it's perceived not overwhelmingly because of the Palestinian interest, but because it's perceived as an Israeli interest. That's why, to my mind, it, it should be more credible than it is. Israelis see it as their vital interest. And the only critical caveat, as, as I hope I made pl plain, although it leads to lots of nuances, is that the independence for the Palestinians not come at the expense of the existence of a viable Israel.
Right. What about the, the question? Yeah, the, the debate thing. I, I no, not the debate. Oh, sorry. sorry, the question of, that was raised initially of of, of not of denying your opponents uh, any any legitimate status. Um, you know, leaving the aside the question of suicide bombers, uh, calling everybody who uses force, even in limited ways, to uh, to resist uh, Israeli occupation. Um, terrorists. <laughs> I, I don't Why not call them something no, else? It, something that gives them a, a rather more uh, state. The, 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 norm, the norm in Israel, for example, when Israeli soldiers were attacked in the security zone beyond Israel's borders in southern yeah. Lebanon was not uh, the, the use of terrorism. Was not the, the, the semantic there was not normally uh, terrorism. People who are attacked, who are, who are enter the, the attack that prompted the war yeah. uh, a year and a half ago, that was regarded as terrorism. This was crossing into Israeli territory. Right? There's just this broader question of, of, you know, who seizes the language and who uses it. Look, the, we are talking here about narratives and perceptions and semantics. These are critical issues, yes. of course. Yes, absolutely. Um, questions? Uh, to the back, the lady in the, um, the red jumper. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sandra. I work in Kabul. My question is, how, uh, how successful, how active is Tony Blair's office being in its mediation efforts? And secondly, how crucial is international diplomacy and mediation within Israeli-Palestinian negotiations still? And also, with Israel's negotiations with other Middle Eastern countries, how, what is the quality of international diplomacy right now? Are they absolutely essential? Well, that, you kind of take us to something that we really didn't talk about, about a great deal, which is the Annapolis process. Um, and, and probably it's good that we, that we talk about it. Um, the, the current game in town is, is this Annapolis pr program, which is a kind of loyally separation between the diplomatic agenda and the, the security agenda, right? It, it, uh, it is, um, I don't know if it's superseding, but it overtaking or coming alongside the roadmap. The roadmap process was meant to uh, um, tackle security and settlement issues as a first stage, and then gradually to create climate in which diplomatic um, horizons could be um, explored. Um, this, this, the players, the direct players, recognized that wasn't going to work. Uh, and therefore, um, this, this, I think, artificial separation uh, of uh, where the idea is you sit down and somehow you agree on the, on the hitherto unobtainable terms for a permanent accord, and it is so encouraging that it, it, it uh, um, um, creates an upsurge enthusiasm which extremists are marginalized and therefore improves the security situation. Um, you, you, you have to say that the Bush administration has come very late to this, uh, having directly engaged a long time. Uh, you have to say from um, to view that there is an unfathomable optimism or purported optimism on Bush's part. I don't, I don't understand why he thinks this can be done in a year, uh, and maybe he doesn't, or maybe he thinks that his friend, and, he, and it's, there's a, gr a great deal of rather fawning friendliness between Prime Minister and uh, an American President, he'll, he'll agree to some kind of deal which, which, which by definition would not be implemented until the security situation allows, and therefore Bush has his legacy and nothing really changed. Uh, I, I don't see how any of this uh, pans out. I think international support, encouragement, uh, um, facilitation is critical, but I come back to that sentence of mine that you quoted, which is, if there is genuine goodwill on both sides, I think anything, almost anything is possible, and unless there are the, the conditions are genuinely ripe between the direct players, then no amount of uh, uh, loyally brilliant international help and so on is going to work. The first part of your question uh, about Blair, Blair, um, I mean, I think Blair is incredibly interesting in the, co I mean, for an audience in Britain talking about um, extremism and the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and uh, I, I had a, I would encourage you, you don't have to read anything I've ever written, but if you do want to, I had an interview with Blair a few months ago, towards the bottom of which he, he talks about um, why he lost his job and his attitude to uh, um, extremism and so on. I, I thought it was really, really interesting, and uh, um, I just hope that so, so you might want to look at it. He is charged with creating uh, or helping to uh, solidify institutions of Palestinian government. Uh, judicial, judicial system, prison system, uh, security forces, and so on. Um, but he's, he is not apparently inclined to try and do that with uh, um, a great deal of outside 
physical uh, uh, helpers coming in, soldiers or, or otherwise. Um, and, I, and he gives every impression of being very, very serious about this. I don't know um, how, how, how far he really wants to see this through. And I, I think he's very skeptical himself. I think he's much more skeptical, for example, than Bush is. And I don't, uh, uh, and I, he talked for, for a lot about this uh, donors meeting that, that took place in, yeah, yeah. in Paris in January, I think. Yeah. He said this is more important than Annapolis because Palestinians are going to come with a real security plan and that's going to uh, start to change things. I think that he, he is becoming progressively disenchanted, but that's my assessment. And I don't know, and maybe you know more about other positions that he may or may not take and other, you know, which, which, sure. which somewhat undermines one sense of, of, of whether he thinks he can actually see this through. You mean he may be called away at any moment to be head of Europe? Right. We have time only for a couple of questions. Hugh. Uh, my, name, my name is Hugh Obviously, For the past 40 years or more, I've written principally about Latin America, where in recent years I've seen the position of the United States be eaten away very quickly and very comprehensively in many countries. Uh, I hear you as an Israeli happy with your principal international um, uh, aid is the United States at a time when that country's uh, star is going down, setting perhaps, uh, 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 which is clear I think, from the situation in the uh, capital markets uh, as we see them uh, going to bottom the moment. They're in Israel without America. I, I, I don't think you could um, overestimate how critical Israel perceives its relationship with America to be, but, but I also don't think that that means that Israel would not be delighted to have many other um, supportive allies. Uh, at the UN, for example, we tend to, to get uh, the US, Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, and Palau. Uh, and I've now looked some of these countries out because for sure I didn't know where many of them were until, until that became clear. Uh, Olmert said, again, I'm sorry to keep quoting uh, um, my own interview, but he, he felt that there was a very uh, supportive wider inst international constellation, or at least somewhat uh, European supportive uh, constellation. He, he, spoke, he speaks not only about Bush being uh, a very uh, supportive uh, president, uh, who understands the, uh, the, the, the realities, but also there's Tony Blair and there's Gordon Brown and there's Angela Merkel and there's uh, Sarkozy. So um, it, it, uh, uh, Israel would love to feel, but it doesn't. I mean, when, when Olmert said that, I don't think that related particularly widely in Israel. I think Israelis look around the world and they think uh, um, we, uh, we have an American now who understands our reality. Um, we, I mean, I'll, I'll be very honest, coming back to the Blair issue, and, and again, I think I'm fairly representing the Israeli consensus. Israel looked at, and I know this is probably not, not the opinion that's going to be shared in this room, although maybe I'm wrong. Israel looked at Blair being ridiculed in Britain for taking what Israel thought were sensible positions about the dangers posed by Islamic extremism. Uh, he's somewhat more diplomatic about that, but he, he basically feels that he, in part, I mean, I, I know there were many other factors, believe me, uh, but in part he, he lost his job, he feels, for taking positions that, from the Israeli point of view, were eminently sensible about recognizing uh, some of the dangers and so on. Uh, Israel looks to Europe overwhelmingly and is concerned. It, it looks to France and it is, uh, according to opinion poll data recently, it seems um, that um, while, while uh, support for Israel in Britain uh, uh, is um, problematic. Um, levels of support or opposition to Israel in France seems to be going down. The, 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 the surveys that I've seen analyzed suggested that um, pulled out of Israel and the Palestinians elected Hamas, this had impact on public opinion where previously Israel had been seen the um, avaricious extreme party and the Palestinians were uh, um, uh, the, the moderates. And that this has shifted. I think therefore Israeli uh, there, there's some sense in Israel that maybe France is better understanding our narrative. There isn't a sense uh, uh, that that is the case vis-a-vis -vis Britain, although uh, um, Gordon Brown may be a personal exception, uh, and therefore we feel, you know, it's, it, we don't choose our friends, we'd love to have more, we're, we're lucky to have America. But you didn't speak, you didn't say anything there to, I'm sorry, you, you're about to, but you didn't say anything there to, to, uh, to Hugh's point that uh, 
Isn't there anxiety in Israel that the United States has got itself into right. very serious okay, I mean, trouble and that uh, what you regard as an asset may be in the way to becoming a liability? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm, that's certainly a, question, a point that you made and I certainly didn't address it, so, so please let me address it. As far as the, um, the American Jewish community has been, I think, the most uh, of a uh, religious group, the most opposed to the American troop presence in Iraq. That created a situation where there's actually a, a, a very rare disconnect between uh, an American Jewish public that is saying, broadly speaking, we need to pull out of Iraq, and an Israeli leadership that is saying to American Jews and others who say they support Israel, if you exit Iraq prematurely, this will involve in Iran, and that is very bad news for Israel. And I think that, in a way, is a kind of answer to your question, and that takes us back to the whole Iran issue and the involvement yeah, of Iran. Yeah. We, we launching through the prism of Iran. Um, you and America are looking most especially through the prism of Iraq. Those are, that there are different uh, imperatives here, and, and that signals the kind of problem that I think you're referring to. Um, it would be, and I'll let me leave it at that. I think that, yeah. that answers yeah. your question. And, uh, I think, Okay, well, one more. It's got to be just one more, I think. Here you are. Hi, my name is Tamar Levi. Going back to the desire for a Jewish majority, uh, I just came back from a Tadmeet Birthright Israel tour, on which I was surprised to find there was not a high make Aliyah agenda. I wonder if there's a common knowledge strategy towards what might be a demographic battle in the near future. You have to explain that last point. I don't understand what you meant. There are very few Jews in a very small place, and the desire is to have a majority of Jews in that place. And people talk about who has more babies, who's going to move to Israel, who's moving out of Israel, and it's in numbers in the thousands, you know, not very many. So I wonder, as a young person, knowing the globalized I can in where I live, people my age who have an affinity to Israel, what kind of strategy Israel has towards oh, this is the Jewish majority and what their attitude is towards Yeah, okay. okay. Do I understand this question correctly, that it's about uh, helping to solve the democratic gra graphic issue by increasing the number of people coming to Israel? That is kind of what you're asking. You're, yeah. you're kind of asking, is there some kind of policy that says, hey guys, we've got demographic issues here, we should be encouraging. Yeah. Professor from Tel Aviv yeah. University talk to us and I asked him the exact same question. He said, actually, moving to Israel won't make a difference. Investing large amounts of money and making a democracy in the West Bank will make a difference. And okay. I wondered okay. Whether okay. So, so that's, a good, that's a good last question because um, I'll get to say something at the end that, that will, will make me happy to... Uh, uh, <laughs> and hey, you can give me that, right folks? Um, I don't think there's a strategy. Israel has wanted to encourage Aliyah immigration. Uh, it's been there for 60 years. Um, I, I we didn't go into my yeah, yeah. family history, which I'm happy to discuss with anybody else if they want to. I felt a, a strong personal imperative to take advantage of the historic opportunity to be of uh, um, a rare uh, um, revival of Jewish statehood. I thought it was incredibly important. Israel has wanted that the, that uh, that the Jewish uh, state be the, the place of choice for, for, for Jews, <laughs> but has respected the Jews who didn't uh, um, make their homes there. A lot of Israeli immigration was immigration without choice. It was uh, Jews from North Africa and Arab countries who, um, who, who uh, felt it necessary or were desperately uh, um, dependent on a Jewish state and, and moving to Israel. Since those uh, immigrations of need, have uh, ended, and really the, uh, the way from the former Soviet Union at the turn of the uh, 90s right. was the last one, uh, Israel has been aware that you know, either the country is attractive enough for other reasons, including the way how unattractive other places are, mm. or it isn't. But there's no, there, there's not a competitor, I'm sure the immigration minister is screaming at me now, I don't think that uh, a compelling strategy, um, and I don't think there's a sense in Israel that more, more Jews are going to turn the the significant Jewishity that could have a demographic impact, of course, would be a murder. Two million Jews were moved to that area, then, then there were, uh, um, uh, and there is no sense uh, in Israel uh, whatsoever that that's going to happen. And the very last thing that I want to say is, um, for my one of reasons, and you, did you say the very beginning about the, about the weather? I mean, the, 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 the one of the reasons why I drove was because I every day. That, that, uh, and and the, the weather, it took me 15 years before I was like, happy when it, and boy, do we need the rain. But I do not feel 
confident and comfortable about the world Jewish mission, about the Jewish state. And I say that, and I think of America as an exception, and precious little anywhere else. Um, but other people must make their own choices. Okay. Well, thank you very much, thank David. You. David has uh, flown into Britain for an 18-hour trip. He came in this morning. He leaves tomorrow morning. This is his third meeting. So he's had a hard day. And so By far the most um, challenging, shall we say. So <laughs> we, we thank you very much for being here. Thank, thank you. you very thank much. You.